Oh, good morning, friends. So nice to see all, all of you here on this Labor Day weekend. Here we got plenty of other places to go, lots of food to go eat, or perhaps you're going to take the advice of your pastors the last few weeks and find some chance to go rest, per perhaps. It has been, it's, it's been quite the week for many, many of our fam families, many of our mem members here. So it makes it so, so good for us to be here today. We have a great morning of worship planned for us as well as communion today as well. Just a couple of quick announcements though before we get underway. There's a greeting card class coming up. This week with Bobby, if you have not gotten in touch with her yet, you have until today to take care of that so she can have your su su supplies. Blast is still looking for some volunteers if you are interested in helping out with our fourth and fifth grade after school program for the students at Montfort Heights Elementary. And if Blast is not quite your thing, but helping kids read and being a tutor with kids is looking for tutors for this upcoming school year as well. Melissa Wills is the person you need to contact for that. Pickleball is coming back in a couple of weeks. There are some Emmaus walks coming up. All of that is located in your bulletin as well as a couple of dates that we have been asked to provide some meals for some of the students out at Colerain High School. Two dinners for the football team. We've done this the past couple of years as well as one for the band this year that we have been asked to provide. You just have the dates there, not, nothing to sign up for yet. Just wanted to get that on your radar. But the commercials are done now, friends. Let us get ready for worship. Let's take a nice deep breath. Oh, let's try to quiet our hearts and minds. Let's try to still ourselves if we can. And let's move into our time of worship as Marianne plays the prelude for us this morning. Still, still with thee. Friends, I invite you now to stand if you are able as we join together in this morning's call to worship. Are any among us suffering? Are any among us cheerful? Are any among us sick? The prayers of faith will save the sick, and all who have committed sins will be forgiven. So let us confess our sins and pray for one another so we may be healed. Amen. And I invite you to remain standing as we join in to our first hymn this morning. What a friend we have in Jesus. 
number 526 in your hymnal or in your online worship guide. Friends, you may be seated. Our first lesson this morning comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Just a few verses. This is Philippians chapter 4, just verses 4 through 9. Friends, I invite you to hear, hear these words from Paul for us this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. 
Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace be with you. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. We're going to come together now for our time of morning prayer. So if you are with us at home today and have an opportunity to maybe still or quiet the environment around you, you can try to do that. If there are some some prayer beads or a prayer square or something that you'd like to hold on to, you can go ahead and get that ready as well. Let us come together before the Lord this, this morning. Good morning, God, and thank you. Thank you for this day and for this place and for all of the places where we are gathered. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that unites us together as one in fellowship, in worship of you this day. What a pleasure, what a privilege it is, Lord, to gather here in your house. To be with our brothers and sisters, to have an opportunity to take a pause, to take a rest, to take a breath this Labor Day weekend. Blessed are you, ever-creating God. In your image, our lives are made. In your glory, we offer all the work of our hearts, and hands and minds. Blessed are you, O God, now and forever. Blessed are you whose work is repaid, for by your work and by the payment you receive, your lives and the lives of others around you and around the world are blessed. We thank God for you day by day. Blessed are you whose work is unpaid, You offer what you can to enrich the lives of others through time, talents, skills, strength, and love. We praise God for your generous labor. Blessed are you who seek work but have not found it, and those whose work now is not yet what it may be, yet still they seek, that your gifts may be shared more We praise you, God, for those diligently seeking, for all of us who are seeking, and we pray, Lord, that soon we may find. We may find work, God, that fills our spirit, that nourishes our souls, and does not just deplete us physically. Work that does not burn us out emotionally or mentally, work, Lord, that we know and trust. It's putting our gifts from you to work here in this world. So Lord, we ask your blessing upon us all for the various types of labor that we all undertake. And we ask God that you are with us in all that we do. But as we lift this up, as we take this break, Lord, we know there are many who are hurting, mourning, and grieving this day. For those who have suffered loss in the last couple of days, Lord, we ask you to pour out your comfort and your peace and your presence. For those healing and those recovering, God, for patience and for endurance. For the healthcare teams, for the family caregivers, God, that they are open to your wisdom, your guidance, and your instruction. And for all, anywhere, Lord, this day, who feel alone, who feel left out, who are frightened and feel like they don't know where to turn, may this be a day, Lord, where they turn towards you and see you clearly for who you are and how you call them and each and every one of us into the overwhelming grace and love that is your kingdom. Lord, we ask in your great mercy that you hear this and you hear all of our prayers. 
And we ask that you hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. If the kids want to come up. Morning, Eli. Hi. So I'm not a pro like Miss Kelly, so can you be patient with me? Good morning, Molly. All right, yep, Eli, I have a seat right here for you. That's why I left a little cushion. It's nice to have buffers, right? Amen. All right, so this morning, we're going to talk about prayer. Eli, do you pray every day? No, sometimes? Night. You pray every night, Molly? Yeah, but we forget. Yeah, it happens. What do you pray for, Molly? Uh, well, I'm going to hold I it. I forget. You forget. Do you pay, pray for maybe your grandparents? No. No? Okay. Um, maybe for your friend? No. Okay. You, you pray yeah. to God. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to hold that. Thank you. Declan, what do you pray for? Mm, I pray every time to um, where we are. Where we are? Okay. Well, sometimes I pray for m- mentally. Okay. I get that. Um, I pray for my students every night, and I pray for my family, for my church family. And my, yeah, my mom. Does that ring any bells, Eli? Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever have a friend that maybe is sick and you pray for them? Mm-hmm. Not really. Okay. So we're going to kind of talk about how it's easy to pray for those people that are easy to love, you know? The people you see every day that you get to have interactions with. Mm-hmm. But we're also going to talk about those people who don't make it easy to love. And we got to pray for them too, you know? Like the car that cuts you off in traffic and you just, ooh, you don't really want to pray for them, but you know you're supposed to the opposing football team that may have beat your favorite team yesterday. Sometimes it's hard to pray for them, too. Yeah, you feel that, Molly? Yeah, I like the Bengal Tigers. You like the Bengal Tigers? So even if they lose against somebody, which we don't want them to, we still got to pray for them. They're kind of like our enemies, right? Do you ever have somebody, Eli, that's not nice to you at school? Have you ever had that? I've had that in life, right? You know, we're still, still supposed to pray for them? Isn't that kind of hard? Yeah? But God calls us to pray for everyone, not just those that are easy to love mm-hmm. and make life fun, but sometimes those that make life hard. <laughs> or really annoying, as Declan just shared so silently beside me. So why don't we say a prayer together? I know somebody. Okay, we don't have to say names. It might be me, and I don't want it to be me. That would make me super sad. <laughs> we all have somebody, I'm sure. Shh, don't say their name. Don't say their name. You can say it silently in your heart when you pray for them, okay? So we're going to pray. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah? All right. So we can bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for these young children and their parents who brought them. Thank you for the opportunity to kind of discuss that sometimes it's hard to pray for those hard people. Um, And that we're supposed to lift them up and encourage them and open their hearts. Lord, even those hard people, let them become easy for us to love and to pray for and to lift them up even more than those that are so easy to love. We are so thankful for you, Father God. In your holy name we pray. And all together we say, Amen. Friends, just want to take a moment to say thanks, as always, for the faithfulness and your generosity.
generosity for the gifts, for the tithes, whether you're doing it online, putting it in the plates out in the narthex, or dropping it in the mail, whatever it might be, it is greatly appreciated and being put to good use here. Mar- Marion is going to offer our musical off- offering this morning, then we will say a prayer of thanksgiving all over all of the gifts that came in, and then we will stand to sing our doxology. couple of notes, it's a new doxology, new month, so make a note of that. It's hymn number 102, just verse 3, that will be our do- doxology this morning. But Mar- Marianne asked if I could share the first verse of the lyrics to the hymn that she's going to play as our offering for us. And it really is just a beautiful verse. So, friends, I invite you to hear these words and then enjoy the gift of song that Marianne will provide for us. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect, yet it floweth fuller every day. Perfect, yet it groweth fuller all the way. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Let, let, let us pray. God, you are so good. We are so grateful. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the faithfulness, the generosity, the commitment of so many whose gifts and ties and services and gifts being put to use here in your house in Montfort Heights, Lord, are being used for good. God, we ask your blessing upon the gift and upon the givers. Lord, that you take everything that is brought in to your house. You take everything brought into this place. And that you bless it 
you multiply it, you direct it, you guide it, you send it out to the places that it should go for the building of your kingdom here on earth. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Friends, you may go go ahead and be seated. Our gospel lesson today comes from the gospel according to Matthew. We're in chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, so kind of a short lesson. Words that might be familiar. Friends, I invite you to hear this with a fresh ear, with an open heart and mind this morning. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father perfect. The word of God, friends, for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, come make your presence be known in this space. Come bring your word to life for us this day. God, I pray here at this moment that I will decrease so that you will increase. Lord, we, your children, we have gathered, we are waiting, and we are longing to hear a word from you. So come be with us. Amen. So if you've been with us these past couple of weeks, you know, we have been talking a lot about rest, talking about rest talking about the Sabbath. About taking time for good rest, holy rest, sacred rest. I mean, as of late, we've talked about just how important that this is for our physical, our emotional, and even our spiritual well-being. We've looked at how Sabbath obedience is even one of the ways that God has always chosen to set his people apart. Rather than enter, entering into the never-ending pursuit of more, God's people are called to take a day to bask in the creation that God called good. And what we're going to start to do today is kind of transition a little bit just away from the discipline, from the practice of Sabbathing, and resting, and we're going to take a look, we're going to reframe some of the spiritual disciplines and practice that we have talked about before. Things that maybe we are doing, things that maybe are a part of our life, part of our 
routine, part of our habits. Just look at them from a little bit of a different angle. And try to talk about how, as we participate in these practices, how we take up these disciplines, the way we see the world can change. It gets reframed. And at the same time, the way the world sees us as followers of Christ, as people of God, the way the world sees us gets reframed as well. You may recall back, back in March of 2020, and perhaps you don't want to go back and think about that too much, we took our time during Lent that year, we focused on... Um, Richard Foster's book, A Celebration of a Discipline. Many of you were here with us for that. And each week was a different spiritual practice. As everyone was home, and as there wasn't much to do, we thought it would be a good time to re-examine some of these practices. And we, we, we talked a little bit more that time about kind of the, the how-tos and encourage you to take up each one of those diff different practices for a week. If you, if you want to go back and find those, they're on our Facebook page. So you can find them on YouTube as well. But this new series we're starting, this reframe series, is going to be a little bit less of a how-to and more about how these practices can help to clarify our vision and our purpose. Just consider the lessons that we shared this morning, these two lessons that we pulled out. And this morning, our focus is on prayer. And if you didn't pick that up from the call to worship that comes from James or the emphasis on prayer and what a friend we have in Jesus, our first hymn, prayer is one of those things that we are absolutely directly instructed to do, called to do. Paul writes to the church in Philippi. He touches on prayer, but he talks about a number of things as well that are ways that are going to set the early followers, the early Christians, apart from the other people there in the city. He tells them to rejoice always. Not sometimes, when not when things are going good. He says to rejoice always. Says, let your gentleness be known to everyone that the Lord is near. How about that? Let your gentleness be known. Let your gentleness make it known to everyone that the Lord is near. Here Paul suggests that it is by our gentleness, by our affection, our tender care for those around us not by force that we make Christ known to others. So in a world marked by sharp words, violence and anger, we can stand out. We are reframed and we are brought into focus by our gentleness. And that is how the Lord is made known. And he shifts in to prayer. He says, do, do not worry about anything. In a world full of constant worry, we are marked and set apart by our willingness and our obedience to abstain, to not worry. He says to be Grateful and in a world full of entitlement, to be grateful and appreciative marks us and sets us apart. It says, seek faithfully in prayer everything with thanksgiving. Petition God with your requests. And pr promises a peace of God that surpasses understanding in return and make note Paul does not promise an answer to your prayer 
Paul does not say we get what we want. What Paul says is that in return for your faithfulness in prayer, you can expect at least a peace of God over you in your circumstances, in your situation. Then he begins to go on a little bit further in verse 8. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, if there's anything excellent, anything worthy of praise, to think about those things. We're so easily distracted by things that are not just, by things that are not worthy, by the things that are not commendable. We get caught up in the division and the fighting and the slander and the gossip and the making up our own answers when we're not sure what the truth is. That we lose sight of where we're directed to focus our thoughts. Because friends, our thoughts are going to guide our prayers and our thoughts and prayers are going to guide our actions. And here Paul says, focus, think as often as you can on what is true, what is honorable, what is just pure, pleasing, and commendable. So our prayer life, our prayer practices, our prayer focus will determine a lot, I think, about how we respond or react to the situations around us that come our way. Here in these lessons from Philippians, in just these few verses, I think Paul talks about a way of getting grounded and centered and getting ourselves ready to pray. To be in an attitude of thankfulness and gratitude no matter what, no matter the situation we find ourselves in. Remember that Paul writes this from prison. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. We turn our attention then to the words of Jesus from the Gospel of According to Matthew, I'm going to talk about turning things upside down. You've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a large crowd that is gathered around Jesus as he's giving this sermon. Those who persecute Jesus and the nation of Israel at this time, they are not in hiding. They are in armor with spears, dressed as Roman soldiers, standing around. They are listening just as much as the crowd who's gathered. People won't have to look far to see the people who persecute them. They won't have to look far to see the people that they consider to be their enemy. So right there, Jesus directs them. I know what you've heard before, but I'm saying to you, you have to do it different. To love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. Man, talk about being a people set apart. Talk about, about being counter cultural. I'm going to talk about a good way to reframe how we see the world and are seen by the world. How about starting right there? How about starting right there with that simple instruction for the simple instruction of Jesus. Because as the rest of that verse goes on, For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? The tax collectors do that. If you greet your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do do that. If you just do the things that everyone else is doing, how are people going to see you and know that you're my disciple? If you blend in so much and you do the things that everyone else is doing, how do you stand out as a child of God? Jesus here pretty clearly and directly gives us one way. We don't respond to our enemies with hatred. We don't withhold 
prayers. We don't withhold seeking God's care and guidance for those we disagree with. But we offer love and compassion to our enemies, and we pray for those who persecute you. Those of a difference of opinion, those of a different political party, those may be seeking to go to a different denomination. Ouch! That's what Jesus tells us to do. Because in doing so, friends, we set ourselves apart. Who we are as followers of Christ becomes clearer to the world that is watching us. As we do that as well, the way we see the world becomes clearer as well. We read further further along here in the Gospel of Matthew. He tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. He talks about not being I'll show you with your prayers. I'm not saying that we do things in our prayer life that are all about bringing attention to us. But if we're a praying people, and I know we are, how are we showing people that we are a praying people? How do we demonstrate that for those people that we're supposed to be praying for? Do do you ever tell the people that you say you're going to pray for that you actually pray pray for them? Happens very common in us. Someone in our small group group chat will send out something. Hey, here's what's going on with my mom. Would like some prayers. And that's not ignored. Usually everyone will either like it, they'll comment back. Then when, when we see them the next time, we follow up and we ask. We don't just going to say, we don't just say that we're going to pray and then never bring it up again. We follow up. We go the extra mile if you want to go if you want to borrow an extra phrase from Jesus. We let the prayer inspire us into some action. So we tell them that we pray for them. We follow up with the people that you pray for. Do you ever do that? So telling people that we're praying for them, following up with the people that we have prayed for, those are a couple of really important steps that we can start to take maybe in kind of shifting or reframing our prayer practices. Because the sad truth is, the sad truth is, is that when we tell people that we are going to pray for them, for many people right, right now, that is just a cliche. But if we follow up with them, if we let the prayer kind of move us to some action, Or if we follow up the prayer by asking them, what else can we do? It shifts it into some kind of tangible reality and tangible practice. And it's still prayer at the heart. It's prayer being put into action. That reframes what prayer does. These are just two lessons on prayer. There are countless scriptures we could have pulled up. We are called to pray in the spirit, to pray without ceasing, to pray for those in authority. Jesus even tells his disciples on the night of on the night of the last supper to pray. He prays for those who will come to believe in him through those disciples. And those disciples beget disciples to get beget disciples. So you and I are prayed for as people come to believe through us and how we Live. The prayers go to the next generation and the next and the next. But I think some, something has just become lost. We, we offer our prayers, or we offer our thoughts in prayers. And there's not, nothing wrong with stopping to say that quick little breath prayer. I know that when I get that, 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 when that email comes through, that prayer chain comes through, that text comes through, I will tend to stop and say a quick prayer, and then I will go back to revisit it. But I'm part of a church family. I'm part of, of a small group. And the vast majority of people around us are not. So how do we get them to understand the need 
other? How, how do we shift our attention to reaching them, to praying for, to praying for them in, in a way that's meaningful? When Franklin Delano Ro- Roosevelt died and Harry, Harry Truman was sworn in as president, immediately after being sworn in, he goes and meets with a room of reporters. He had been the vice president. He's f- familiar with a lot of these men. Harry, Harry Truman walks into that room and says, boys, because back then it was all men, I'm, I'm sorry. He walks in and says, boys, if you ever pray, pray for me now. I don't know whether you fellows have ever had a load of hay fall on you, but when they told me yesterday what had happened, I felt like the moon, the stars, and all the planets had fallen on me. I've got the most terribly responsible job a man has ever had. Pray for me. I mean that. There is an earnestness and a frankness in that prayer request that you can hear, that you can hear his spirit crying out for the spiritual support of those men in that room, many of whom probably did not agree with him. But that type of honesty and openness and vulnerability, adding that into our prayer life, I think there's much that we can reclaim with our identity as God's people, as a praying people, by speaking truth about what our needs are, about how people can be praying for us, being specific, starting to integrate that into our prayer life. Praying like that reframes us, how we see and how we are seen. We're not going to spend time today getting into, you know, what your prayer life may look like. We all have different routines. We all have different ske- 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 schedules. And I trust that we are all praying. In fact, I know that we are. But I do have two kind of wrinkles on prayer practices that I have experimented with in my own life that were shared to me by one of my professors back in sem- sem- seminary. I've graduated now, so I can say back in sem- 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 seminary. Two wrinkles on your prayer practices that might be transformative for you. And if it transforms you, it's going to transform those around you. If it transforms those around you, it's going to transform those around them. And guess what? It keeps getting bigger and bigger. So our personal practices have a lot about transforming community as well. Two new pr- practices I just want to offer for your uh, attention. If you are an evening prayer, a nighttime prayer, who's, who tends to be a pre-bed bedtime prayer person? All right. not, not asking to change anything about what that you do because it works for you, hopefully. But how about this? Before you pray, you invite the Spirit to speak to you, to minister to you, even as you sleep. Especially if we are busy, if we are neglectful of the resting and Sabbathing and spending time with God that we should be, if we invite God to even speak to us as we rest and as we sleep. How, how often in Scripture or be told about the dreams and the visions that come as that hap- happens. So, just an invitation. It could just be one more line at the beginning or the end of your evening prayer that invites the Holy Spirit to come minister to you as you are sleeping. And here's the scary one. If you're a morning prayer person, who's a morning prayer person? I challenge you sometime in the coming days or in the week ahead that as you finish up your morning prayer, do not say amen. Do not close that prayer. And allow every word you say for the rest of that day to be included 
into your prayer. We want to simply define prayer as just talking with God. Imagine everything you say to every person you encounter as something that you are saying in a conversation with God. If I'm honest, this has led to much apologizing and much confession in my life in the days where I have tried this. Try to leave it open. Try to leave that prayer open with every conversation you have and every interaction you have throughout the day and see what that changes about the person that you talk to. See what that changes about the person who cuts you off in traffic. Because the, the truth is, friends, prayer absolutely matters. Who we pray for matters. And then how we live into and embody our prayers, it matters. It can certainly change how we see people. And it changes how people see us as well. May we be praying in such a way that those far from God start to come a little bit closer. Amen. We're going to move to a time of communion here in just a moment. So if you're with us at home and want to get your elements ready, you can get that ready now. Our communion song is number 641 in your hymnal, Fill My Cup. You can stay seated. I invite you to sing that song as you get ready to come to table as I go and get the elements ready. Just want to take a moment to remind us all again that here in this church and in the United Methodist Church, we celebrate open communion. And if you love Jesus, if you want to love Jesus, if you're not sure about Jesus, you're just trying to understand more about him, you are welcome at this table. But here in the gifts of bread and cup, you can encounter Jesus even if for the very first time. This is not the table of Montford Heights United Methodist Church or of any church. This is the table of Jesus Christ. And you are invited here. We will take communion today by intention. And as you come down the center aisle, we're going to break off a piece of the bread and hand that to you. You will then dip that in the cup, just the bread, hopefully not your finger. Take it out, turn it over so the juice drains down into the bread, then you may partake. We will have some gluten-free ele elements available as well. Just let us know if you would need that. The re responses can be found in the hymnal, friends. Let us begin. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign, our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters 
and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your whole Holy Spirit on us gath gathered here and those at home as well. And on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Two sides set up for you, friends. We'll invite you to start in the back, make your way down. If you would like us to deliver to you, just wave to one of us and let us know. There are some gluten-free ones we have right here. Friends, the table is set, and you are invited. Come taste and see that the Lord is good.
let, let, let us pray, friends. God, we ask your a blessing upon this time of gathering and sharing in the holy meal. God, we ask that the gifts that you offer to us, the bread and cup, nourish us, fulfill us, physically and spiritually, to make us ready for the tests and the trials, for the work and for the mission that lies ahead of us. God, we thank you for your presence here as we partake and for your sacrifice that allows us to enter into glory unashamed. Amen. Friends, our sending song this morning is number 382 in your hymnal, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Friends, it was a wonderful to see your faces and have you here, and I encourage you this week to you know, take a closer look at your, your prayer practices. Who are you praying for? Who are you not pray, praying for? Are you following up on your prayers? And is how you pray making Christ more visible in the world? And if not, how can we bring it more into focus? After I pronounce the benediction, I'm going to invite you to have a seat and remain seated through the postlude. My friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you peace, his peace, the peace of God that transcends understanding. Friends, go from this place in that peace, 
knowing you are covered in grace and you are so very loved. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 